Hey, welcome back. This is another case of let's remake parts that are obsolete and not available from the OEM anymore. This whole assembly here is something like a dampener. There is a spring on the inside. Well, there is not anymore because I took it apart already. And in front here we have a hinge section that's riveted together. It's not anymore because I drilled the rivet out to take measurements. And we have some kind of a receiver piece back here. And this part is not available from the OEM anymore. And it's a fairly important part. So I start, already started with this front piece here. This is the most si simple part. And this already has some, has some work with an angle grinder done to it. And I remade those already five times. And the next part will be this fork piece. I already did one, four more to go. I need, I need four in total, but I doing one spare. Material is 316L, which is 14404. It's stainless. And tolerances in general, some, some tolerances are very loose, like this radius here, but some are pretty tight. The fit between those on, on this fork, on this swivel section here is very tight. It's pretty tight. Also, I didn't show this first part because this part is pretty much the same, only a little bit com more complicated. So I'm only showing the complicated part. This is a simple one. <laughs> Let's start with these pieces. I cut, I cut the stainless stock to length and already turned the radius on the end. This is a radius small enough so I can just use a six millimeter radius tool on a lathe and plunge this radius in. The next step will be to go to the milling machine and cut all this contour up here. And then we go back to the lathe, hold it like this and turn the small diameter here and drill and tap the end. The reason why I'm doing the milling and then go back to the lathe is because I'm cutting the slot with a wheel cutter, with a large 63 by 5 millimeter wheel cutter. And I'm not confident at holding the part for milling on the seven millimeter shank and having all this force from the large wheel cutter acting against the part would be very good. So I'm holding it on the, on the large diameter before I turn it down, do all the milling and then go back and do my turning. We're going to do all of this with the horizontal spindle of the FP1 because that's very accessible and very good visible with the indexing head in a vertical position. You'll see in a second why. So we drop our stock in. I need about 20 millimeters above the jaws to do my milling. Clamp it firmly. Next, we can either take the 3D probe or a dial test indicator or an edge finder to locate my part in X, Y, and C. And since I already have a drill chuck in here, which can take up to 10 millimeters. I'm going for the edge finder. Our first milling tool is this 63 millimeter diameter, five millimeter wide wheel cutter. This will cut the central slot through the part. To touch off on the Y, on the Y location, I'm just going to run the cutter and then approach it until I hear the cutter touching the material. Since the sides of this part will get milled down anyways later, I don't care about the touch mark from the wheel cutter here. I'm going to run this at 63 RPM and a feed of 40 millimeters per minute.
This type of wheel cutter with the staggered teeth runs very very smooth on even a lighter duty machine like this FP1. As you can see one tooth is always slanted like this and the other one is slanted like this and also they are side cutting. They are not like a, these cutters are not like a saw blade that don't have teeth on the sides. These have cutting edges every other tooth on the sides too means that you can for example use them in in axial direction to cut a radius into a part or you can use them to widen a slot. Note the crosshatch pattern on the side walls of the slot. This means two things. First of all the tram of the, of the horizontal spindle of this machine which is basically in the machine geometry is good. If the spindle was off uh, like this from the y-axis it wouldn't leave this mark. It would act like an untrimmed bridge port spindle for example. And secondly that's also the sign that we used a staggered tooth wheel cutter because the saw blade would not leave the side wall finish. Since these teeth cut on the side and the tram is perfect the teeth will cut when when the wheel enters the slot and when the trailing edges cutting edges come into contact they will again scratch over the surface yeah the scratching could dull the cutter but in reality that's a no problem let's continue now we need to turn the part 90 degrees and cut those side flats okay unlock the spindle and go 90 degrees I have a large dial down here which goes from 0 to 360 degrees to give me a general idea of where I'm at. And here I have this large graduated dial to get my 90 degrees. I have a six flute finishing end mill and a side lock holder and a, and a weld on holder. And the way I'm going to cut these flats is I'm dropping the cutter down to here then I will move the cutter into the part or the part into the cutter depending on your coordinate system where you're uh, higher thinking and then I will drop the table to climb cut the flat on the side. I can take a fairly hefty climb cut with the setup because the table is dropping down and the force of the cutter is not pulling or moving this very heavy table around at least not in C direction. So, and to know, no, these are the flat, these are the flats with the radius lead out here on the sides. And so I know where to move my end mill. I dimensioned these two, 10.4 and 7.5. I need to drop the cutter from the top of the part down 10.4 millimeters center and 7.5 from the center line away. That's where this radius needs to be and then I just cut a flat out. So when you make the drawing yourself you can help yourself by adding dimensions like that and make your work in the shop quicker so you don't have to calculate radius points or something like that.
So let's spin apart 180 degrees and cut the flat on the other side. So I took one pass, that was first one, roughing with 0.15 millimeter allowance. Then I took it to final dimension. And then I took a spring pass again at the final dimension, just to take any deflection of these thinner ears out. We're over at the lathe and I'm working on fish finishing these parts that we just worked on on the milling machine and this one is already done so we still have this fork feature back here but now we have the shank turned down to 7 minus 0.01 millimeters drilled and tapped the end and also machined a shallow counterbore in here and we have a nice two millimeter lead out radius in here to reduce the stress riser in here and make this part strong that's very similar to the original part so Let's see how we do this. So the part goes with the fork side into the collet and we need about a shoulder length of 30 millimeters. So we move out about 32 millimeters. So we have a little bit room to the face of the collet. In a previous step, I already center drilled all of these parts and now we can bring the tail stock in. Normally, I wouldn't use a tailstock on this part. This is short enough and thick enough so I could turn it without much deflection, without tailstock support. But since we're only clamping on about two millimeters of material, apart from the fork feature, will, which will not give much rigidity in the collet, I'm adding the tailstock and create a very solid setup here. The tool I'm using here is a two millimeter wide parting tool or grooving tool. So this tool has a one millimeter radius, hence the two millimeter width. The diameter on this tool is already set. I only need to touch off on the end of the part. Like this, and now I can rough down the shoulder. You might notice the smaller the part got in diameter, the worse the chip formation became. And that's due to the uh, surface speeds getting lower and lower, the smaller the part is. I'm running at 2000 RPM and I'm feeding at 0.15 millimeters per rev, which is fairly quick. And the smaller the part gets, the worse the cutting conditions get. That's something to consider. And I started out I did all the roughing dry and at this point I would need to add coolant because the cut is acting so bad or behaving so bad that coolant will be a greatly improvement. Also the part is getting fairly hot which is a problem for the precision cut on the end. This definitely needs to cool down because 
uh, I can't touch this very long, it's hot, it's hot. I reduced the feed to 0.06 millimeters per rev and I'm taking a semi-finishing pass. There we go. Yeah, coolant helps a lot to, to pull the heat out of the part. And also I took a facing cut outwards at my final C depth uh, or step length, depending on how you want to call it. So that's that. Okay, uh, chamfer tool. You might notice that I switch back and forth between water-soluble coolant and cutting oil. And I use water-soluble oil or coolant when I have high surface speed, high material removal, I need to get heat out of the part, I need a lot of it, and I don't, don't want to smoke up the, the shop because at high cutting speeds, cutting oil will burn away and smoke like crazy. This is mostly steam. Cutting oil, on the other hand, that's for heavy forming cuts when you have to use a form tool or a chamfer tool that's, or a tap, that's cutting oil. Okay, that's done. Now I can do all the end work, drilling, tapping and counter boring. This is just a Kratex stick, rubber bound abrasive to give the surface a last polish and remove all hairline burrs or something like that that might be created by the chamfer tool for example. Drill chuck for drilling obviously. We have a 2.5 millimeter pre-drill because I don't want to force 4.2 millimeter drill into solid 316 stainless. Four point two millimeter tap drill. A little bit of a countersink for the tap to start. And an M5 tap, which I will not run all the way into the, the hole because I want to bottom it out and that I will do by hand because I feel when I reach the bottom of the hole instead of uh, running it with the machine. Cutting oil. Go. Loosen the drill chuck, unwind the carriage, get a tap handle on here and do the last few turns by hand. Since we started it with the machine guided, uh, there is no danger of getting it crooked anymore. Uh, that's, a, that's okay, that's bottomed out.
Ugh. Next tool is a tiny, tiny carbide boring bar for the color bore. And we have a done part. Looking good. And fits perfectly into the assembly. Oh! Ha ha ha, that means precision, right? No, it doesn't. Uh, the plop noise you will get with a very, very, very tight fit, but you will also get it with a 0.1 millimeter clearance. So, uh, if you hear somebody making this noise and telling you, oh, that's a precise fit, yeah. So you just saw me preparing these parts. I cut them previous already to length and you saw me drill all the way through with a six millimeter drill to give me a starting point to work from there. Next step is threading an M12 by one fine thread on here. And then we do some boring from both sides and we machine a 10 millimeter hex on the end. This part here is scrapped. I, I did the threading too long. So we have four here and one in the machine, one spare, one additional spare to the one spare that we already did. The other parts, we have five of the prong shaped parts back here and five of the, of the mating parts. So hopefully we get five full assemblies out of this. So we get one full spare assembly to the four we need to make. I'm a little bit weird when it comes to spares. Once I run into the issue that I run out of spares, I, if it's not too much work, I will make another spare. For example, when I'm doing the boring now and I scrap one, I still have the one spare. <laughs> uh, a little bit weird, but Sometimes that's quicker than uh, wasting your one spare very early and then noticing very much to the end that you did a mistake and you need to do all the setups. Again, maybe you already have broken down tooling. That's the most annoying thing. And yeah, then it's just a world of hurt. So I try to keep my, my number of parts plus the spare constant. The spare is really for emergencies. I have a threading tool in here. This is a ER16, so external 16 millimeter. That's the insert size and R for right hand thread. And it's a full profile insert, so it's, it will cut the root and the crest of the thread. I set the lathe to one millimeter pitch. I'm going to eyeball my thread start. Just lining the point of the insert up with the face of the part, setting my DRO to zero. I move in the length of my thread relief, plunge in, move back the width of the thread relief and pull out. I'm doing the thread relief with this tool. Go. That's the thread relief. Also, I put a chamfer on the end with the threading tool, but we will deburr it after threading anyways. Engaging the half nut, 
I'm threading usually with the thread knot constantly engaged. So we start with a scratch path at full depth, some cut, uh, not full depth, at a uh, major diameter here. Okay, that's scratch path. Get a scale in here to double check my pitch. That's looking very good. And now we proceed on threading. Straight in feet because such a small thread doesn't need a diagonal in feet, really not. Even if some people make you believe it. Okay, I'm at final depth. Now I take a few spring passes to get all the flex out of the part, the spindle and the tool. Okay, let's do a last one for good measure. The chip that came off there was just a whisper of metal. You can judge by the thickness of the spring pass chip how much deflection there is in the whole system. There we go. No, no real chip formation anymore. The heavier you rough usually the more deflection you get and the more spring passes you would theoretically take to take depending on st how stiff everything is. So there we go, that's the threading. Oh, I was running at 400 RPM for the threading. So uh, relatively quick for a manual machine with a one millimeter wide lead out. Chamfer tool. This is a 90 degree or 45. If you look at the half angle uh, carbide it's like ground like a deep bit almost. And this is my preferred chamfering tool for ID, OD, for everything. You can even do, use it for facing or if you orient it in 90 degree offset for OD turning or grooving at 90 with a, for V grooves and stuff like that. Very versatile, very, very cheap tool. Uh, just a piece of carbide it can be a old end mill ground in half and a decent amount of clearance angle on the underside. Put a as nice as possible finish on the cutting edge and it's it's the best chamfering tool for a manual lathe. Okay, I need to bore out the backside to 9.2 millimeters at uh, 34 millimeters depth. I pre drilled it as you saw previously with 6 millimeters. And this boring bore is too short to go 34 millimeters. So I'm going to bore as deep as possible and then I follow up and do the rest of the work with a 9.2 millimeter drill that has a flat end ground onto it. This boring bar has a coolant hole through it and I'm piping in coolant from the back. Just a, a tiny bit.
These are the blanks for the next parts. The final part will look something like this. I'm probably going to make it a little bit simpler. I already did a test part over on, on the milling machine because I, I messed up the thread on the back side. I tried it with a, a tab, but the result was very bad. But I used it to, to figure out a way to machine this contour here on the inside and I have a plan to do it now <laughs> so prepared five of these blanks first one already has an M12 by one fine thread on the back side and this screws together with these parts very nicely and it's threaded in a way so this part bottoms out on the floor here and there is a recess board here on the top that grabs the, the mating part here on the OD. So this increases strength against bending. At least that's what I, that's my interpretation of the original design. This is a, a very shallow, shallow thread, very short thread relief on the back. I'm doing about 1.5 millimeter thread relief in the back and I'm single point threading it. I'm using all P horn carbide boring tools for the ID work here. I, mean, I have a small boring bar to, to create the hole. This is a hook tool, a little bit too long, chatterers like mad, to do the undercut, the thread relief. And I have a nice stubby ID threading tool here that has been reground. Also, I have another tool to do the, the counter bore on the outside. The, 2.5 millimeter deep counter bore here. Okay, let's go to the lathe. Yeah, and of course I use a drill to poke a starter hole in there because I don't want to run the boring bar into solid material. You can, in some cases you can use these to bore into solid material, but I would not, I would prefer not to do that on 316 stainless. These are expensive. It's like 25 euros a piece and you can only buy them in packs of two. So, each time you need one of these, you pay 50 bucks. But the, the, the <laughs> well, I'm always uh, the, the guy that looks on the, on the good, good things. This way you build up a tool inventory. You need one and you get two. two one goes into your tool storage and one gets used. Also, when you have two, you don't break one by accident. It will last forever. If you buy only one tool, it will break guaranteed because you uh, just by handling it. That's uh, just thing of reality. <laughs> we start with a spotting drill. We start by tightening the collet chuck of the lathe. Then we follow with a spotting drill. Followed by a six millimeter drill. And I'm setting the zero of this drill on the face of the part with the tip. So for that, I'm just using a gauge block. This happens to be a seven millimeter gauge block. I run the drill against the gauge block. Note, do, don't do this with your measuring gauge blocks. These are just old, very worn, scratched gauge blocks that I use for, for this kind of stuff. So you run the drill up against it and then you set your DRO to the thickness of the gauge block. And then you move it up and zero is exactly on the face of the part. Now we drill 
11.5 millimeters deep. There we go. Switch to our P horn tool holder and change the insert. These tools have this trilobe shaped shank which repeats very well when you take them out of the holder and put them back the diameter if you use the same tool usually is well within 10 microns and even if you switch between inserts of the same type the diameter repeats very very well these are ground to a very tight tolerance across the tools so we go to this one this is a 12 millimeter thread, M12 by one, one millimeter being the pitch. So we need a 11 millimeter hole to thread because 12 millimeter nominal diameter minus the pitch always is the tap hole size for a metric thread, no matter if it's standard pitch or fine pitch. And as you can see, this, this, this tiny boring bar, this took uh, about 1.5 millimeter depth of cut, three millimeter in diameter in one pass. So that's, um, keep in mind, this tool can work from a bore starting at four millimeters, or I think even three millimeters, if, if you're a little bit careful. Uh, these are mighty impressive tools. And yeah, they're really, really good. So this is the last pass. And when I'm at, at final depth, I will do a facing cut to the center. A little bit of cutting oil. Here we go different tooling system. This is the Goering 104 micro boring system. Very similar, but it uses a round shank with a angle cut on the back to orient the tool. This is a 45 degree lead angle with a 90 degree included angle. So this is great for cutting chamfers and counter bores with a chamfer. And I'm just using magnification to line up the tip of the tool with the face of the part. Like this, zero it out. Okay, cut the shallow counter bore and chamfer the end of the part. This is easy to touch off on the face of the part because it has a flat face, so we can bump it into the face of the part. We go all the way in, 11.5 millimeters, minus a tiny bit so we don't scratch on the back wall. And now we pull the tool out to 12 millimeter in diameter to create our undercut for the threading. And this will sing, this will make a noise. So I plunged in three times and then I took a, a, a traversing pass to clean up the, the undercut. Okay, that was undercut. And once again, tool change. Uh, this is not the ideal way to do it. In, in, a, in a best case scenario, would, you would have multiple of these, of these uh, base tool holders. They are expensive. They are like a hundred bucks. Well, 
they are absolutely worth their money but from if you if you think of a hobbyist standpoint they are very expensive but these tool holders can be made can be made yourself i made them myself in the past like this one here for a boring head or this one for a uh, boring bar holder these are made from i think free cutting mild steel and then case hardened they work perfectly fine i went with two m3 screws i didn't know that p horn uses a, a very large i think it's an m6 fine thread uh, set screw i went for two m3 screws and i'm using regular cap tat screws because these have a full-sized hex and these can be tightened probably m3 set screw has a tiny hex and well they strip all the time i think i did these back when i had my uh, on the cnc mill but you can also do them on vertically standing up drill two holes on both as both sides and then mill the tangents the the ends here the two radii don't do anything the only important surfaces are the two angled surfaces on the outside. That's where the that's where the tool seats itself. The radius on the end is clearance. So these are very approachable if you want to use these tools. And these Horn Super Mini 105 tools show up in used condition on eBay for very little money constantly. So you can buy a real a large batch of them for truly little money and these are very very easy to resharpen you they, with a fine diamond wheel you can do a lot with these and now for the fun part threading lathe is already set to one millimeter pitch i'm touching off on the face here and i know that it can go maximum 11.5 millimeters deep. I can watch that on my VRO. Okay, first pass. This is of course a high concentration operation. This uh, you, you can't do this on a fly. You have to be at least medium focused. If your machine is half decent quiet, you can also hear once the cutter reaches the thread relief and then immediately you let go of the spindle drive and the spindle on this machine doesn't have a mechanical brake it's, it stops so instantly because i'm running it off a vfd a variable frequency drive and it has a brake resistor so i can run a a very very harsh uh, braking cycle on the on the motor stop <laughs> and i'm taking 0.1 millimeter in diameter passes and it's time to do a test This is one of the cases where I don't have a, uh, a matching thread gauge. I'm just using the parts that I made to match it up, which is fine in this case.
Okay, that's starting. And at this point, you, <laughs> you take lighter and lighter passes uh, if you don't want to overshoot like crazy and create a so-called wobbly thread. And once you did the first one and it fits, you know how much to offset your tool to get the thread on the first try. I don't want to force it in, but also I don't want it to be sloppy. Let's see, I'm using a wrench because it's all oily and I can exceed about zero torque on the part. Oh yeah. Um, I think I will leave it like that. Since this, since this is not a topping insert, not a full profile insert, this raises a little bit of a burr into the, into the ID of the thread. And once I have it deburred, I'm very confident that this thread is a winner, as we call it. Uh, it screwed in with very little effort with, with the wrench. You saw me holding it very, very short. Okay, uh, how to deburr the thread, you ask? The answer is Kratex. Spindle in reverse, start at the back and the thread will feed the Kratex stick out like this. Okay, test fit. After deburring, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Ta-da! And that's the nice thing about the single pointed thread. It, it runs pretty much true. So, perfect. Uh, one done, a few more to go. This is the original part and I wanted to show you one of the features on this part that is a little bit tricky to machine. We have this radius cutout here. This is a slot with a radius floor, but it's undercut. So so it is undercut, so the part that you slide in here cannot escape this way. It slots in. So how do you machine this? Well you could use a lollipop cutter which is a an end mill that looks like this. These are a pain on a manual machine. They require quite a bit of speed on the spindle. Or what the OEM did, they took a 4.5 millimeter drill and they put two holes in here and then they machined away everything else. And I can't tell that it's drilled by the tool marks on this wall here. So that's exactly what I'm doing also. This is my test piece that I did. You can see my drill surface is even nicer than the OEM surface. Bleh. Um, I already did one of the parts. Well, I did two. One is in the machine. Uh, drilling two of the holes and also I'm roughing most of the material away with a 8mm carbide end mill because I can really hog off some material with the with carbide end mill compared to a 
19 millimeter high speed steel end mill that I'm using to cut this huge radius here. Uh, I did this one completely from solid with the with this 19 millimeter end mill and it took fairly long because this has to run relatively slow. I ran it at 400 rpm which is already pushing it in 316 stainless. So to increase that, to increase the speed on this process I'm taking an inexpensive carbide end mill. Oops. Well, that's a cheap, cheap carbide end mill now. And I hog off most material just with the part in this orientation when I'm already here drilling the holes, I can also machine on those two surfaces. And I need to do some milling on it anyway in this orientation because I'm doing these as a batch. I'm doing all of them like this. Then I come back, take them again in the three chart chuck and I do all my milling with the large, with the large end mill and also this uh, internal contour milling here with the horizontal spindle. And that way I do have to remove the vertical head of the mill only once. It's a little bit more indicating effort, but indicating the part is faster than lifting the head of the mill off with the hoist five times and putting it back on five times. So that's always a thing to consider. Over at the, at the milling machine, this is the one part that I still have in the vise. Let's take it out. Just making sure the faces of the jaws are clean. Otherwise we have a chip in between and we dent everything and just create a little bit of a mess, which we don't want to. Setting my stick out and putting a decent gronk on it because we are taking a little bit of a cut here with, with the carbide amp mill. We start with a spotting drill. followed by a four millimeter drill. So I pre-drilled with a 4mm drill and now I follow up with a 4.5mm. Common consensus is that using a drill bit to open up very small increments on a hole doesn't work. I don't know where this comes from. It's, um, um, how to put it mildly, it's BS. If you go from a 4 to a 4.5mm drill, the drill will take a very fine chip and leave a really good finish on the drilled wall. We're speaking cheap high speed or affordable high speed steel drills here, not expensive carbide drills. Expensive carbide drills behave a little bit different, but in general, you can do the same with those too. You have your 4.5 millimeter drill. It will remove 0.25 per wall. And if you add a little bit of cutting oil, That's a very economical way if you don't have, if you don't want to use a reamer and still want a pretty okayish hole compared to just slamming a regular high speed steel drill into solid material. That's my five cents on drilling. Drill chuck comes out, carbide amp mill goes in.
Okay, you have to be a little bit careful if you're running a, a Deckel mill or any other mill that uses this style of collet because these have a limited holding power and you can pull an end mill out of these collets and I have it done in the past. Uh, if you're really out for heavy material removal, a side lock holder is the way to go. Or, if you're feeling a little bit fancy, a hydraulic tool holder. Took the vertical head off, have an indicator in the spindle and I'm re-indicating these parts with a lot more overhang out of the three chart chuck parallel to the y-axis just by, by traversing the y-axis back and forth with the indicator on it. Chuck is tightened to a medium gronk so I can still use my parallel pliers on here. To adjust my parallelism. Okay, that's very close. Ugh. Okay, let's zero it out. Yeah. That's within 10 microns. Now I can cronk down on the three charge chuck. And it moved a tiny bit. So we, we go back, we loosen it a tiny bit. Well, a good amount so we can still move it. Okay, now we crunk back down and it moves again. So minus one. Yeah, that's still within 10 to 20 microns. Perfectly okay for this part. So you saw me plunge cutting most of the radius into the material and I will take another plunge cut and then I will drop the C-axis down in a climb cutting matter to clean up the thickness to dimension two. I will do that probably in two passes I guess.
Working in this fashion has two advantages. First, we have the increased stiffness of the horizontal spindle because we don't have to deal with the vertical spindle that's cantilevering out far more. But also, we can do this fairly heavy cut in a, uh, as a clamp cut. We're dropping the table down and the cutter is walking this way, so it's a clamp cut. But we have all this weight of the indexing head and the X carriage and the C carriage hanging down, counteracting the force of the cutter wanting to pull on the part. And that's more than enough weight to overcome this. And for that reason, we can do a fairly heavy climb cut on this machine on the C axis with the axis dropping down. And the surface finish we get with this method is, let's see, it's pretty darn good. You will have a hard time making out chatter on this surface. So let's spin it 180 degrees and do the same on this side. And then we can come in with a micrometer and check our, our thickness. Second side milled. We got a tiny breakthrough down here, but in overall, the pre-drilled holes seem to be reasonable straight. If you poke against the thin slit of material up here, yeah, it's very thin all, all the way. So that's perfectly fine. This will get milled away anyways and cleaned up. Uh, let's check the thickness. So 7.5 is the target dimension. And we got 7.5 minus 20 and a little bit microns. So perfectly fine. Now we can spin it 90 degrees towards the horizontal spindle, change to a smaller end mill and do all the detail work. I changed to a 4mm carbide end mill in a side lock holder. Means it has a screw from the side that locks the end mill, hence the name side lock. And now I'll just do milling by numbers. Uh, plunging in and plunging two relief cuts in, then hogging out all the material. Yeah, I could use a, a large end mill for hogging out, but you will see that this goes rather quickly. So time to do the cutout with a 4mm HPC roughing and finishing carbide end mill. Touching off on the face of the part to determine my, my height against the part. The first thing we're going to do is to plunge in the two corner reliefs. Which will allow the milling to be done in a, an easier fashion. This end mill has a center cutting geometry so plunging is not a big deal for it. And my setup and my tool holding is relatively stiff, so this goes very well. And now I start to rough out all the material. Going to almost full depth and the first thing I'm going to do is to cut a slot down the center. Now 
I'm doing the center slot in two passes because one times diameter in stainless with this end mill with the rather bad cooling from the cutting oil is troublesome. I did it on the park before and everything started to get a little bit hot. So taking it in, in two depth passes and now I can step over sideways when I'm after I got rid of the chips to minimize recutting a little bit. It's on manual machining chip recutting is well it happens and now I can just step over and hog out the material. Since this is not a full slotting cut anymore, things go way more easy. And also you might notice that I'm doing roughing in this configuration as a climb cut, which is very beneficial for tool cutter life, tool deflection. This way the cutter gets deflected away from the work and not deflected into the work like it would be on conventional cutting. And now we're breaking into the the holes that we drilled before with the vertical spindle which will result in this weird uh, lock-up geometry where a part will slide in later. Unfortunately, I don't have the part that slides in there as a as a sample part. I had to go by the dimensions of the of the real part or the the OEM part. That didn't take too long, um, despite it being a 4mm end mill. This cut would have benefited from running flood coolant, which I set up on the milling. I filled the tank of this milling machine with coolant and I can run cut flood coolant now. But as with all, most tool room machine, coolant is kind of an afterthought. And when you run coolant with the indexing head on this machine, you end up with a fair amount of it on the floor. I'm going to design a separate chip pan for that or coolant pan. Isn't it beautiful? Beautiful roughed out. Looks like dog poop. So here we're finishing the part or the pocket in this part more to say. First I'm doing a semi finishing pass all around the perimeter of this pocket just to get rid of most of the stock allowance that I left when I roughed it out. And now I drop to final depth and just do the floor finish. Just uh, dropping down, stepping over and moving out again. Always keeping the climb mill direction. And I'm stepping over about half to three quarter of the end mill's diameter. Yeah, there is some chip recutting happening down at the lower end of the pocket. But to be honest, on, on a part like this with an end mill like this, it's not a crazy problem. It would be a problem if we were hard milling with a relatively small tool. But this is a very, very robust tool and also the, the requirements for precision and surface finish here are reasonable. So it's not going to kill us. 
Uh, there, there was some stock left on this lower wall of the pocket that I'm removing here. Then I'm finishing the side walls. Also, you can see that the the upper edge of the pocket, where the the drilled radius exits the material, is razor sharp. So. I retract the end mill a little bit from the floor and I'm just trimming away this razor sharp edge and create another facet on, on, on this part. This will make deburring in a defined matter by hand way easier. Okay, this is starting to look like the part should look. And as you see, none of these steps really take long. It's just the addition of all the steps together. Uh, this, this milling of this internal contour. At first when I looked at the part, I was like, eh, I'm going to do that on the CNC, yada, yada. But this machine is probably faster than my CNC just because it can remove metal so fast. Okay, now we need to drill two holes and thread them. So, a six millimeter spot drill. Next, a 4.2 millimeter drill, which is the tap drill for an M5. the sink low range on days like this I would like to have a long shanked counter sink for the tapping the FP1 does not have a quill on the horizontal spindle so instead I put a four millimeter pin in, the, in this chuck and I use it to guide a tap with a, with a regular uh, tap handle not exactly high tack but for two holes it's fine um, once I, I will probably get an extension compression tap holder with 40 taper so I can use the horizontal spindle for tapping too.
I would be standing in front of the machine, but the camera is standing there. So that's why I'm tapping so weirdly from the side. Super uncomfortable. <laughs> okay, that's five millimeters red. Drop it down to the other hole. I'm not even adding cutting oil. Everything there is so oily. Ah, there we go, second thread. Now we spin the part 180 degrees around and use the countersink on the back side too. Just to make it a clean product. for the back side. Last step will be some chamfers and radii. Tool change again. to a uh, two millimeter radius deep bit. This is a concave radius cutter round on the deck less one with a formed wheel. Okay, we're at zero. We're chamfering the long edges and we're putting a, a radius on the, on the remainder of the diameter edge here. I finished all the horizontal spindle work on the rotary table, or on the indexing head that is, and now I need to mill both sides of the parts flat in this back area here. For that I put the grinding wise on the indexing head, crammed it in, and now we're here with a 9mm carbide roughing end mill, 45 degree helix. This, this is a wonderful tool, cuts very free, uh, running at 2000 rpm and we're just barking off the material.
And here you can see what's going on in the device. I have two parallels where the flat of the part rests on, two lower parallels that space these parallels apart, and one spring back here that keeps tension on these parallels so they don't clutter around when I change parts. Works very well. Part comes out like this and parallels stay put in place and there is no danger of chips getting under them. So at this point my video documentation unfortunately falls apart completely because I was running out of time on this project and I needed to ship them before Christmas. Uh, deadline problem. So here you see me using a 12mm carbide ball end mill and I'm cutting the concave radius on the back end of the part on the rotary table. I'm using the grinding wise for work holding. I slid it around on the faceplate of the, of the rotary table or the indexing head until I got the part held in, in the vise to center. And then I just used the carpet ball end mill to plunge down and rotate the table at the same time. And that way I created this large fillet cut on the back. As you can see, clearance against the column or the vertical column bellows was pretty tight, but kind of worked out. It wasn't too terrible. The ball end mill that I used was in a horrendous condition when I began. I had some chipping. I used this to, to drill holes in hardened steel, so that's not very nice for a <laughs> that's not very nice to a ball end mill. But it, it worked out in the end. Cut the radius. I'm using um, coolant out of a bottle here because running flat coolant on this machine with the indexing head is a, let's say, it's a mess. So I'm just using coolant out of the bottle and most of it steams away anyway. But it's less smoky than cutting oil in this this application. So here I'm taking the final pass as a climb cut just to clean up the the curved surface. and a spring pass. So different tool, same setup. This is a 45 degree chamfer tool with an, this is an indexable head that can be changed out. And I'm cutting the chamfer that transitions from the radius to the OD of the part. Uh, this tool is made by Mimatic. Uh, very nice tool, but the inserts are very expensive. And I'm also chamfering the top end of the part here, while I already have a chamfer tool in here. Unfortunately, since I had to ship the parts on time, I don't have footage of the full assemblies. Here you can see one put together, but without the rivet that acts as the pivot pin. And here are the full assemblies with a rivet turned of stainless steel and then riveted or peened over with a ball peen hammer on the backside and cleaned up. Again, I didn't film this. A lot of Scotch Brite and Kratex wheel work on the stainless parts to get all edges and corners chamfered and rounded over. 
final cleaning in the ultrasonic cleaners some um, never seize on the threads so it doesn't seize up when i put it to when when i get finally assembled and i also made a screw from stainless steel that you can see in the left upper corner in this picture uh, each of these assemblies needs one screw so these are the flux capacitor springs i hope you enjoyed this I'm a little bit sorry that I didn't film everything out to the end of this project, but I hope it was still valuable content and again, a exercise in finding the right order of operations to make a real part. So thank you all for watching and I'll be back.